up to. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to School Psych Podcast. Really happy tonight to uh, be here. And I know a lot of us are getting ready to go back to work. I know I return from winter break tomorrow. I'm not really feeling it too much right now, but um, we're in this together. <laughs> we'll, we'll be okay. But um, I'm Rachel. I'm a school psychologist in Maryland. I'm going to pass it over to Rebecca, and she's going to uh, talk a little bit about how to participate live tonight. Rebecca? Hello, everybody. I'm Rebecca. I'm a school psychologist in Connecticut, and I am so grateful for you all who tune in live and who listen later. And I want to let you know that if you do listen um, later in the on your commute to work, if you go or whenever you listen, please feel free to continue the conversation. Um, if you're live, you can chat right. You can log into your YouTube account and chat right alongside our uh, video here. We will be offering, uh, our guests will be offering three giveaways today. So we encourage you to stick with us and uh, participate because you may be a lucky winner tonight. And um, if you are watching and want to uh, send a private message, you can do so on either of the Facebook pages, School Psych, Your School Psychologist, or the School Psych podcast page, which if you like and follow, you'll get updates to our um, upcoming podcast events and uh, things like that. So please do that. And then on Twitter, comment using the hashtag Psyched Podcast. I'll be looking for notifications in real time tonight and as the week goes on. Um, so we look forward to hearing from you. And I'm going to pass it off to Eric, who's going to introduce himself and our wonderful guest. Thank you, Rebecca. Hello, everyone. I'm Eric, and I am a school psychologist also in the state of Connecticut. And as Rachel said, we're sort of lamenting that winter break is over. We're all going back to work tomorrow. So um, it's. I think I felt that same Sunday night blues uh, since I was a little kid at the end of winter break or whatever, summer vacation. So here we are years and years later <laughs> feeling the same thing. But we're excited to finish our winter break talking to a wonderful guest this evening. Um, Dr. Julie Barta is here and she is going to talk to us about trauma, uh, supporting trauma in the schools, trauma-informed care. She is a practicing school psychologist and licensed educational psychologist in California. She's worked with ages 2 to 22 in public schools from the Chicagoland area as well as the state of Delaware where she was awarded the School Psychologist of the Year Award in 2016. That's wonderful. Um, Julie is certified in the neuropsychological model in education, Dr. Bruce Perry's model, which I think will be really interesting to hear about, and uses these concepts to, to support child development in schools and in the private practice settings. She loves working with children and adults so that they can learn more about their brains, behaviors, and how to reach their goals. So we are excited. Welcome, Dr. Julie. Hi, and everyone. I, I, I'm wondering, as uh, we start out, could, could you tell us more about the training that you've had in uh, trauma-informed support for schools? Sure. So I, you know, the first time that I read The Boy Who's Raises a Dog from Dr. Bruce Perry, my my world changed. I, I mean, really, my my view on kids in schools. And so I started taking a deeper dive into, you know, how I can even change my day to day sort of practices when I work with kids. And I decided to formally uh, go and get that NME training as it's abbreviated for. Uh, and it has been a game changer for not only me, but for our campus. Uh, so I, about two years ago now, I went out to the boot camp. I think now everything's virtual. So, uh, you know, obviously not the same, but the, the quality and the ongoing coursework is phenomenal. And really that training is all focused on understanding more about the brain and what happens when we experience trauma or adversity over and over and over again and how it begins to build different types of pathways in our brains and um, ones that are adaptive and responsive to that uh, environment, but maybe not always the best one to apply when you're sitting in the classroom. So um, that has been my formal training. And then, of course, like the rest of you, I, I geek out and read just about any article that I can get my hands on related to it. That's fantastic. Uh, go ahead, Rebecca. Sorry. <laughs> Took me a minute to get my mute button. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I, I was just going to 
um, ask you a little bit more about Bruce Perry and his um, and and what that training was like. We had um, an incredible guest, uh, I think, a few months ago, uh, Melba Marquez Green, who um, has worked uh, pretty closely with him and speaks so highly of him and his work. Um, can you? Tell us a little bit about what that experience was like and how long how long is the workshop and um, do you recommend it? Like, is it something that like an everyday school psychologist could use at um, a, a part distinct from whether they think they could um, apply some trauma informed practices at their school? So, so I, my short answer will be yes, um, but I wanna put an asterisk by it because it's not cheap. So the, the training that I went to, um, and, and we'll talk a little bit about the, the districts that I'm in now, and I completely recognize the, the, um, the amazing gift of great leadership and willingness to support trauma-informed practices uh, in our school district and the reality that many school psychologists face, which is not having that leadership and not having someone sort of put their money where their mouth is, right? In my school district though, they actually paid for me to go uh, out to Denver and, and complete that training. It was two days for uh, a boot camp style training and then nine months of coursework. So, uh, which can be completed on your own time, which thank God, I think it took me probably a year and a half, not nine months, yeah. right? So <laughs> it took some time to get there, but um, Dr. Bruce Perry is an incredible, human being, so talented um, and so so grounded. You know, there's something about receiving training from someone who you can feel and see and hear how much they take care of themselves. Uh, and and I, I can't underestimate that. You know, when you are working or interested in trauma-informed practices, I think many times the, the people that sort of start to follow that path have been uh, impacted by trauma in some way in their life that makes them more curious about it. And at the same time, uh, it can be really easy to ignore and not sort of explore our own issues or vulnerabilities or boundaries or whatever it might be. And so, um, you know, in addition to taking care of yourself, it's really important that when you go through a training like this, you have someone like the cohort um, from Dr. Bruce Perry's group. So we all kind of connect and we chat and we say, oh my God, the teacher said this about the training. Um, just to make sure that you have other people to check in on because it can be, it can be tough, you know, for things to keep popping back up. Awesome. I wanted to ask, um, we've had a couple different guests on to, to speak about trauma. I know that trauma informed is kind of a big uh, term that gets used mm -hmm. a lot now. What, what does that mean exactly to you or, or in general to, to be trauma, trauma informed? What does that mean? So can I, can I make a confession and just tell you, I'm kind of like bled out on the term trauma informed, even though I'm using it frequently. Um, and the reason that I'm kind of on it is because it's just like, it's such a buzzword now. And I don't even know, to be honest, what it means because we've, A, we've all been traumatized. <laughs> we've all experienced trauma in our lives. And so it kind of, when we use that term trauma informed, it kind of implies the, oh, the traumatized and the not traumatized. No, I mean, the reality is before age 18, most people, about three and four people have experienced at least one significant adverse experience in their life, right? So, so it's not a, it's not a, oh, these kids are, are broken or traumatized. It's really something that should be applied for everyone. So I don't know what that fancy term is that kind of encapsulates that and sort of uh, conveys a different message. But sometimes I use things like, you know what, this is understanding our brains <laughs> or this is a biologically sensitive approach to supporting kids. And no matter what term you use, whether it's trauma sensitive, trauma informed, the bottom line is it is how you interact with people and how you understand people. Kids, adults, it doesn't matter. Disability, not having a disability, it doesn't matter. It's not a canned curriculum. It's not a thing you can buy. It's about an understanding and an approach 
uh, when you interact with a child or, to be honest, a lot of our staff too. I love that you're saying that because as we um, restart school after a couple of weeks off mm -hmm. here in Connecticut, I, I've been really thinking about um, the way the pandemic has really highlighted how um, how our different populations of our students are disproportionately um, impacted and and experiencing this pandemic um, in serious, significant ways that make them come back to us in in such a vulnerable state that how we talk to them um, how, and by we I mean you know, the bus driver and, and the, the person that they pass on the sidewalk on, on their way into the building and, and just everyone. Um, so I love that point because I think that one of the things that um, I believe was not in the ACE study, the Adverse mm -hmm. Childhood Experience Study, uh, was um, just poverty in general or racial trauma. Those things, um, weren't counted as, as the, one of the, you know, and, and certainly they weren't trying, I think, to have an exhaustive list. They were just looking at, you know, predictors of health outcomes, but, but I think those are really significant and important. So uh, I like that point that we yeah. all have varying levels of experience with it. And um, our vulnerable kids in this current situation are even more vulnerable right now. Mm -hmm. You're right. And, and, you know, one thing that was frustrating for me when I, when I worked in Delaware is that, you know, we, we quite literally had Joe Biden shopping at the grocery store across the street from our school. Okay. And all the teachers, oh my God, it's Joe. Now imagine, right? So we have that population. And then we also had a population who was coming from whatever you want to label it, inner city, oh, our kids in poverty, et cetera. So we really had two worlds within a campus. And when I thought about the ACE study, I thought, well, what about my kids who came in this morning and said they already heard gunshots at 730 in the morning? You know, that, are you trying to tell me that couldn't possibly be an ACE, right? <laughs> an adverse childhood experience? Oh, your alarm clock is, is hearing someone get hurt. Uh, and, and so there's a Philadelphia ACE study as well, if you guys haven't heard of it or checked into it. But anyone who wants to see the traditional uh, ACE questionnaire expanded a bit. Kids who are involved in the foster care system, um, kids who've been bullied. Uh, that is actually captured in the ACE study uh, from Philadelphia. And, you know, there there's greater racial diversity, socioeconomic status, the things that the original ACE study didn't have. But guess what? It all kind of was the same, only even worse for kids of color or kids who are living in poverty. Um, and so when we think about the pandemic, too, and, and coming back and circling back to the staff who are supporting these kids, we know how pervasive uh, adversity was before the pandemic hit. And part of what makes this complicated and how we're going to respond to kids using a tiered system approach, if you have one, I hope I hope you do, <laughs> um, or some sort of loose one, is um, really making sure that the adults are incorporated into that. And, you know, it can be a really tough thing, I think, to incorporate adults and to ask them to um, reflect and maybe take care of themselves. But the reality is a dysregulated adult cannot regulate a child. And so right now what's happening for a lot of our families, though, is that we have kids at home where parents aren't at home. And so they literally have an absent parent who, in some ways, not by any fault of the parent, are experiencing something similar to neglect. Right. They don't have the social richness that they once had in the structure that they once had when they were in school um, or for parents who are home um, and they need a break <laughs> or they're in the other room and they have to close the door because they can't have the kid in and out while they're doing work. So we're going to have a lot of kids who've experienced almost like neglect like symptoms when they return. And I think likely you're going to need quite a bit of time, quite a bit of time to, to adjust. Absolutely. So Julie, can you tell us a couple of ways 
that you got started after after the training and um, feeling probably impassioned and, and ready mm -hmm. to make some big changes. What were some of the first things that you did? So, you know, if you if you've ever gone to a, a good conference, you come back with that attitude, right, Rebecca? And if you've been to one where you're like, I don't know what I just learned, and you're kind of like, I uh, almost need another break after that. But this was this was the former and um, I came back so ready, so excited. And also knowing that I can't do this alone. It's not appropriate for me to do it alone. Um, and, you know, it's it's something where not only do we need administration, but we also need teacher buy in. And so one of the first things that I did when I came back is I almost made like an informal mini um, are you interested in learning about this question mark group, right? So I asked just different teachers who I felt like were actually already using trauma-informed practices or sensitivity in their classrooms. Uh, and I also asked the, the front staff, always get your secretaries involved. I know you guys know this, but they are like good people to know. Um, and they also sometimes are like really big gossips and they know a lot of stuff. And so I think it's really important to have them as part of your team um, because when they know a lot and they hear a lot and they talk a lot, that's also where you can start to just so quietly change the narrative about how they're thinking about a child or how they're thinking about a, a parent, right? Oh, they're late again. They're always late. Rah, 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 right? <laughs> Versus, oh, they're late again. I wonder if I should put in a referral to the resource room. You know, there are different feelings in how you approach. Um, and then, of course, we had our administrators on board as well. And we basically just came up with a plan together. So I, I brought back the information in a way that was, I could allow my geeky self to just go through it with a fine tooth comb. Oh my God, do you see this? Do you see these statistics, right? Oh, wow. And then I said, okay, but like, you know, the same way we practice at IEP meetings to remove jargon, how can I remove jargon from this process so that it makes it digestible and approachable for people? Um, and some of that I could do on my own. And then I took it to the, the team, my interested people to figure out how to refine that and uh, expand it to the rest of the campus in a way that felt safe and and to be honest pretty slow pretty slow we're on about two years now um and it takes time it takes time one of the things that i wonder about is that whether or not um as people get a little bit of understanding and information about trauma whether or not there's sort of a um, there's a, a a point in their learning where um, they can understand uh, um, behaviors that may be related to trauma in students and and what they can do to be supportive and help, but there there are sort of there are potentially these invisible um, things that happen. I, I remember seeing, for example, this video, and maybe some of you have seen it because um, it was kind of viral last year, perhaps, where um, in one clip, a student, you see a student, a very young student, get on the bus, um, walk into the building, and go to um, his classroom. And that student, the bus driver, is like, eh, get to the back. And then uh, the person who greets them at the front door is like, all right, everybody, keep, zip it up, be quiet, let's get to our classroom. You know, like just very sort of cold and um, and just busy. And you know, there that you can see in the adults in this video clip that their own, is, you know, not issues, yeah. but their own agenda was primary. And then even the teacher, the teacher was um, giving sort of critical feedback on behavior and, and how to, how to behave and what to do. And another teacher came by and said to the teacher, oh, your class was out of control in the cafeteria today. Tomorrow they're having silent, it was like very punitive. And then in the next clip, with just small tweaks in the adult behavior, the bus driver looking at the student in the eye and saying, you know, good morning, Johnny. Um, and just little things like that, it, you could just feel in this video, mm -hmm. how this child could feel so much, a bigger sense of belonging and safety. But, but I wonder, you know, often as adults, we don't realize how our own agenda um, plays out and, and from the eyes of a child and how the things that they do seem, can, may seem like 
purposeful or willful. And I wonder what were your biggest stumbling blocks um, in getting adults to change behavior? Oh, Rebecca. Okay. So <laughs> this is a silent laughter from everyone here, right? Because you're all muted. Okay. This is a really important thing to talk about. Um, so again, I will, I will, I will say that having leadership is critical. Having leaders on that team who understand what trauma informed is, uh, and being willing to try it is huge. Um, and you know, sometimes I think it depends on the, the culture of the campus as well. So if you have a majority of your staff who are burnout themselves, um, it's not going to be very easy for them to access the parts of their brain <laughs> that really the kids need to. And that's why we spent the whole first year just on the adults. We didn't even bring up the children. Um, you know, some and some staff push back on that. How dare you ask me how I'm doing, <laughs> what I do to take care of myself? Uh, you know, it's about the kids, you know. But it really was few and far between. And having those conversations began to plant small seeds. So even if there were big reactions in the beginning, you know, six months later, I, I had some teachers come to me and be like, you know, I was I was thinking about this. And, uh, you know, and we'd have another conversation. Um, I can't underestimate how important it is to to have patience and understanding and kindness for the staff that are in your district um, and in your school building. I don't know if any of you guys have taught before. I remember when I was at school at the Chicago School, one of our professors there, Dr. Bill, shout out to my TCS people if you've had him. Um, but he, he said, you need to go in a classroom and teach. Right. And so part of our internship was actually going in and teaching a class. And I'll tell you, it was terrifying. And not only that, but I think a lot of school psychologists really we like our job in a lot of ways because we we have a plan for the week. Right. Then it never is the case. That's never what actually happens. Whatever is in your planner. Right. So like it's always different. The, the monotony of a classroom, at least for me, is kind of. It's not for me. It's not my style. There's many challenges that come with it. And I'm going to say something really controversial here. Are you ready? Kindness isn't free. Kindness isn't like confetti that you can sprinkle around for whatever those things are. Okay. It's, I love the sentiment and it's super cute and it's super sweet. And kindness is not free. When you are kind or compassionate, or you take that moment to look at the kid who gets on the school bus, who's like, what's up, and they're riling up their whole bus or whatever it is, right? For that bus driver to access the parts of their brain, to be able, ooh, okay, right? I'm gonna put on my trauma-informed lenses and I'm gonna be like, hey, how you doing this morning, right? That takes energy. It takes time, it takes effort, it takes interest. Kindness is not free. And so my, in my experience, when people have the ability to access the kindness, they will use the kindness. Many people don't have the, um, like truly a really strong drive to be anti-kindness, <laughs> right? Usually it's just, not being able to catch a breath themselves. Um, and the reality is too, how many of us have walked past someone um, on the street, right? Who was asking for money or, you know, not donated our time to a soup kitchen at Christmas time, whatever it is. Like, but does it mean we're bad people? No, it doesn't. Does it mean that we didn't have the, the space to access that kindness or energy? Maybe, maybe. So I, you know, I, I think a big piece of getting the adults to buy in is about supporting them and their needs, um, which I caution you, yes, you will get a little bit of pushback on, but it's incredibly important. Then the other piece, part two, is there is a lot of interest in, yeah, but they're a bad kid, or they're annoying, or I'm tired of them, 
or um, I think he does it just to be manipulative, right? Maybe, <laughs> maybe, and you still have this kid. Um, and, you know, I, I think we all know the sort of approaches in terms of like turning a negative phrase into a positive one. Oh, saying he's manipulative versus he's um, great at negotiating, right? So we all know those simple sorts of practices, um, but more often than not, the, the saving grace that I found in our process is showing people data. I have had the you know, data, yes, cool sign people, virtual high fives, right? It's a saving grace. Um, it's something that even the grumpiest of gooses will be able to say, like, I can't really argue with that, right? Or maybe the argument turns from it doesn't work, it's wrong, to, well, I see, but I just don't like it, right? And there's different weights to that um, and different kinds of conversations that can be had then when you when you have that information. That's awesome. Reminds me of two things I want to say quickly, and I'm going to let mm -hmm. Eric talk because I'm hogging all the airspace tonight. Um, <laughs> uh, when you said, you know, it, we need to start by taking care of the adults, and um, recently we've been trying to to take care of our adults in, in our return to school um, past, uh, you know, last last spring's, um, you know, chaos in, in schools with, with COVID-19 and then and, and really preparing our teachers to be okay and feel okay so that, that they feel like they can take care of others. And teachers before the pandemic, it, teachers are the profession with the highest level of burnout the doctors before the pandemic. So I can't even imagine if we measured the levels of burnout right now in schools, what they'd be like, I'd be afraid to learn. But I think that's so important. And um, and then the point that kindness isn't free reminds me of this um, study. And I believe it was, um, well, I don't know. I think it was with seminary students, but they were te they taught these seminary students about the importance of compassion and kindness, and and then they did uh, an experiment on them where they asked, they taught the lesson, and then they gave some of the students this time pressure task, and some didn't, and they planted a person in need on the sidewalk that would be that would cross their path and and ask, you know, for compassion or or. Mm -hmm. Um, kindness and the the students with the time pressure ignored just ign just ignored the two hour lecture that they just heard and you know uh, walked right by but uh, the others didn't and I I think that another thing teachers have in common is time pressure this pressure that oh my goodness students missed a semester of in person instruction yep. or they're still remote now and how am i going to catch them up and how and so the 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 lack of self compassion i think that many of us you know you know include myself have um, really i think needs to be addressed because if we're going to be really critical and harsh and cruel to ourselves in our self talk um, going to be hard for us. Yeah, you know, I think a lot of school psychologists, and in part, I'm going to blame ratios, right? Like the reality is we went through a lot of really cool training, where then when we actually get into our schools, what we get to do is not a lot like that. Uh, and, and we have such high numbers. And then, you know, I think a lot of us too haven't, um, haven't necessarily done, for example, our own therapy or our own good habits with self-care. And then when we start experiencing those stressors throughout the year, it just is really easy to crumble and fall apart. Um, but I, I really appreciate what you're saying and you're absolutely right. It is um, not only important for us to take care of ourselves um, and be mindful of um, some of the stories we tell ourselves. So for example, you were talking about, you know, with the time task, right? And they walk past somebody. Does that mean that you are a bad person or does it mean that this is biologically how our brains are programmed to respond under stress, right? Is it really any coincidence that so many people under time pressure walked past that person that they're all bad people? Or <laughs> is this what happens when our brains are too overwhelmed and it shuts down our frontal lobes, right? So keeping in mind when the bottom part's activated, the top part didn't work so good. You know, it 
just hearing all of this reminds me of just how much work it takes to affect change within a system, you know, especially an education system, and um, how, as you as you mentioned already, Julie, um, you know, you have to be patient. Um, you focused on the educators first for an entire year before even beginning to roll out, yeah. and um, and then this is uh, assuming it sounds like you probably already had a good three-tiered uh, you know model in place already or maybe <laughs> sure eric <laughs> hopefully <laughs> and so you know then and if not then how do how do we address some of those things at each of the tiers so it i i guess my thought is um in just talking to school psychologists those and and educators who are affecting change um, you know, those are really important things to do, to think about that this takes time um, and and how much we have to focus one step at a time. So yeah. um, some really good questions came in, too, while uh, Rachel flashed these up on the screen. Um, one of my friends, uh, co-workers, colleagues, uh, school uh, education special ed supervisor asked this great question. Um, you know, it also dawned on me that um, people stream uh, streaming this um, probably can't read the question. So um, I, if it's all right, I'll just read this out loud for those who are streaming. Um, fully cognizant of the need to focus on the kids, how do you create a system to help students with trauma, inclusive of the pandemic, when a lot of staff itself may be dealing with their own? Yeah. So, so the first piece is is focusing on the staff. Um, and the the second piece, I think, is to really make sure that you have uh, an identified group, hopefully of multiple people, similar to when we would do crisis response, right? So if there's a death in your district or if there's some other crisis, who are the people who respond to that? Uh, and are they available in this moment coming back to respond in a similar way, right? You know, even just going from our day to day, how things have looked now, and then going. Can you imagine now going back to work full time? I know some of you have. We haven't here yet in California, um, and even that change in our schedule will spike our stress, <laughs> right? So making yeah. sure that you have people who are available is huge. Um, if your crisis team is not. Um, able, you're stretched thin, you have all these testing, blah, 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 everybody's busy. It is okay to pull in other people as well. People who don't necessarily have training. And here, here's, I want to be fairly specific about this. Um, people are therapeutic. Relationships are therapeutic. You don't have to be a therapist to be therapeutic. It's why we call our moms and we cry because we mess up whatever it is. It's why we call our friend and like, my God, my husband's doing this, right? People are therapeutic. Relationships are therapeutic. And so I think putting that in the front for both the adults and the kids returning this year or next year, whenever it is, is huge. And the other piece to kind of go in with the question is, um, <laughs> You know, asking people if they're okay. And maybe people don't want to talk about it, and that's okay. But it might even be worth figuring out with a with a small group of people um, how to do some sort of uh, voluntary, universal um, support for adults. Because, you know, again, before the pandemic, I, I heard somebody say, we're, we're all about three, are you okay's away from a breakdown. <laughs> Are you okay? I'm fine. I'm fine. Are you okay? <laughs> right? So three of those before the breakdown actually hits. And I was really surprised when we started um, responding and supporting with staff uh, with one small group check-in with one grade level team. And I said, how are you guys doing? What do you need? How many teachers cried that day? And it really opened my eyes to understanding some of that burnout, Rebecca, that you were referencing too, and how high those levels are, and how tough that is for people who want to serve and who want to support. So um, it, it's to be inclusive, uh, answering that question. And it probably looks different for everybody's campus. Um, but one thing that our campus has done is to um, make sure that we have regular meetings and interactions with 
with people. Relationships are therapeutic. So tell us a little bit about the Zen Den. All right. So I know we came up with a super cool name and you guys all want to know what the Zen Den is. So um, I did send a couple of pictures. So I don't know if now would maybe be a good time to share that. But our, our campus um, is pretty small, but we had a lot of kids who were in crisis and our administration was recognizing that, right? And maybe because our mental health support team wasn't big enough at that time, now it is, but they were dealing with a lot of the brunt of it. And they were like, what is going on with these kids? You know, they're taking so much time with the discipline. And um, so we decided to make a Zen Den. We're the Bruins, so it's the, it's the Bruin Den. Um, and really it was a classroom that was um, essentially taken over by us uh, to make a, a structured sort of room and setting where kids could come de-escalate or uh, actually escalate, which I know sounds really strange, but we can talk a little bit about that. Um, you know, we have this spectrum of stress and how we respond to it. We're all really familiar with the externalizers, with the loud kids, the screamers, the runners. And then we also have other kids who disassociate, right? They pull back, they're falling asleep. Um, they're zoning out. <laughs> right? They're just gone. And a lot of times, no matter where a kid is on that spectrum, there is um, there's stress behind that response. And so the Zenden was created to be able to support both kids, both types of kids or both moments for kids. And um, we have here a couple of pictures, I think, to be able to share with you guys. So this is the, there, there are several different um, pieces of furniture, I guess you could call it, that we added to the classroom, our Zen Den. This, yes, it's a huge ball pit. Oh my God, I know it's a ball pit in our school. And do you see all those little colored buttons on the edges? You can change the colors that light up the ball pit. Let me tell you, there is no one too old, okay? who does not like a ball pit. Now, how are we gonna deal with this in COVID times? I'm not sure, okay? So I don't, <laughs> don't know how to answer that for you. That entered my uh, head too. So I, that was like immediately popped yeah. up and then you're like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the world where everyone's vaccinated and COVID's not a thing, right? Um, and then here is an LED carpet where it slowly changes the color. And we have some kids just like face plan on it and just hang out there for a while. And actually that white bench, I know it doesn't look, too thrilling, but it's really cool when you, um, so we sync it with music uh, and it rumbles. It rumbles to the beat of the music. Um, and so this is, and there actually was a, a bubble tube as well in the other picture with the, if you see in the background, there's a big tall tube and it's got bubbles that go up and it also changes colors. There's weighted blankets, there's those pod things that you can sit in. Um, it looks a lot like a really cool OT room. There's some other things that aren't uh, in these pictures, like um, those rockers you can stand on your feet and then you have to balance. Um, we have a coloring station, Play-Doh. The reason why these things are here is not just because they're super cool. It's also because they're all items or tools that can be used to help regulate kids. And so when we talk about pushback from adults, let me tell you, okay, people who say uh, he's just annoying and he's manipulative. Can you imagine then that teacher sending a kid here to play in a ball pit? Are you kidding? I'm not sending him to the Zen Den to get in a ball pit. How dare you even suggest that, right? So here's the thing. Do you remember when I talked about data? <laughs> the The ball pit is not just the ball pit, and it's not just some miraculous sort of um, playroom. There is a really consistent structure to the Zenden. The kid comes in. The kid puts on a, a oximeter, right? We have them check their heart rates because, as we all know, 
there is not always a matching inside to our outside, right? So say we're gonna get up and give a public speech, right? My outside, I'm, I'm cool, I'm calm, everything's okay. And inside I'm like, no, yeah! right? I'm freaking out. And the same thing happens with our kids, right? Sometimes they're, I'm fine, I'm cool. I'm gonna go back to class, no problem. I'm not gonna hit them, it's fine. Okay, and then they go back to class and they punch the kid in the face, right? <laughs> so the, the heart rate is not always a perfect way to see if they're escalated, but I'll tell you what, it narks out a lot of kids. So when they have a heart rate of 140, your heart rate's not resting, bud. You're not, let's talk about getting you down to 80. When they first come in the Zinden, they take their heart rate and they also identify a feeling. So we write in their initials, the time in, their heart rate coming in, and their, their feeling. We've got a lot of these little guys for the younger kids. So are you cranky? Are you friendly? Are you silly? Are you excited? Because there's a ball pit. They can name as many emotions as they want. And then they get to choose any activity they want in there. It's really important to allow them to choose because they're there to regulate. So if you're dictating and telling them how to do it, you know, like the, the ball, the ball pit is dysregulating for some kids. Okay. They were like, you know, there's too many balls. I don't want them touching me, whatever, but they'll totally zone out with the bubble too. So they do that. We walk them through some breathing exercises. Um, and when their heart rate starts to come down, then we start doing some of the verbal processing. Can you tell me what happened in Ms. Brown's class? Yeah, this and that, that, yeah, right. And then we check their heart rate again. On average, most of our kids are in and out of that Zen Den within 12 minutes. 12 minutes, okay, where we go from a rate, of, a, an average heart rate of 140 down to something like 80, where we go from feeling like angry, jealous, to happy and peaceful. It's really an incredible thing, but there was a really careful um, setup to that whole process to make sure that it, it worked well. That's that's so awesome. And, you know, I think that all of us as school psychs have, have done like the heart rate thing, like kind of manually, like listening, you know, that mm -hmm. I never thought about an oximeter before. And that is yeah. super cool. I think that that would kids would like that. It's fancy, it's techie, it's kind of a yeah, new thing. I yeah. myself bought one um, just when the pandemic was getting rolling, just, you know, <laughs> how am I going to test my family yeah. if they're sick? Like, how do I know when I have to go to the hospital type of thing? So I, you know, have one now and realize how cool it is. So yeah, awesome. <laughs> yeah, they, they do tend to gravitate towards it too. And then we've actually done a whole classroom wide visits to the Zen Den as well to kind of normalize it, get kids talking about it. And then we just have them all write up their data on the whiteboard. It's already there. It's a classroom. Um, and so it's kind of cute to see the kids who have already come in and used the, the oximeters to measure the, oh, you guys, no, you do it like this. You do it like this. No. And you have to write your feeling down first. You can't, don't get in the ball pit until you do this, you know? And it's really sweet to see that opportunity where there's safety and structure and used and uh, I'll segue into our next piece in a regulating way. <laughs> So I know we were thinking uh, we're doing a little bit of a giveaway, right? Um, yeah. So how did how did you want to choose um, who who would uh, get this giveaway? Do you have a question for them? Right? Yeah. Here? So a, a, a critical piece that I want everybody to think about from now until the end of time is these three things: regulate, relate, and then reason, and in that order. First, we regulate kids and ourselves. Then we relate then we reason. No one who's peeved or upset is going to be able to reason, is going to be able to do math or control themselves as well as they would be able to if they were regulated and relationally content. So the first question is, what are some activities that we do or could do in schools that are regulating for a child? When I say regulating, I mean, um, you can think some of Maslow's stuff. You can think about just the real basic stuff that we need to be regulated. Awesome. So we'll keep an eye on the chat box and whoever can give us um, the first you know, adequate answer, um, uh, we'll, we'll go with that. I also had a question while, that, while people were typing. Um, 
I was, you know, as so school sometimes, uh, most often of the time, you know, we're, we're strapped for money. We don't have money. And then once in a while, there's like, oh, there's this pot of money that somehow came to us and we need to spend it like tomorrow. Otherwise, yeah. it goes away and we'll never have it again. And I had a similar had a situation like that before where the principal came to me and it's like, you know, and, and the whole team and said, you know, we have like $8,000 or whatever. Mm-hmm. You need to spend it immediately on trauma informed things. Yeah. And so I went kind of down this rabbit hole of what are trauma informed things yeah. and uh, like, how do you know and what is the research behind that? And I had a hard time finding kind of concrete research. It seemed like a lot was like theoretical, like, OK, this should regulate. But there wasn't necessarily a study that showed that that this. Um, so when you're I guess all that to say, when you were designing your Zenden, how did you come up with what would be what would be added into that and where should we be looking for that type of research or are we just a little bit you know that research is coming down the line all of the, you know we were often in this kind of um situation where sometimes we have really good things but they haven't been researched yet and then do you wait yeah. for the research do you jump in and you know that type of thing do you have any thoughts on that yeah so this is part of where that it's not like a can thing sort of comes back in right i think it, it feels good for us to have like a canned curriculum or something and the reality is a lot of times we just don't have that Um, but things that are regulating are what we put in the zinten and so before i spoil anything should we talk about our winner for the first prize i think so so it looks like yeah (laughs) answer um mindfulness um daily mindfulness messages in the morning Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so mindfulness is kind of an easy, easy one, right? A buzzword that we're using a lot of. But I would peel back a layer on that a little bit and say, well, what is mindfulness? <laughs> like mindfulness in and of itself isn't necessarily regulating, but breathing is and slowing down and being observant of your surroundings is, right? Okay, so, so was it Serena? Oh, no. I didn't see who won. Okay, so I'm gonna send you this fancy pants know your brain poster, which has a lot of cool facts on it. And I talk to kids a lot about like your brain is floating in liquid. I tell them just like that. I'm like, do you know your brain's floating in liquid? Isn't that gross? Do you know it's as soft as butter? Oh, please be careful and don't get a concussion, okay? So anyways, there's a lot of cool facts on it and congratulations. One thing about regulating activities is that I know, you know, when we all get stressed too, we're like, oh God, what's regulating? Just tell it to me, right? Think super simple, guys. It's having clothes, okay? (laughs) It's being warm. It's being not too cold. It's having your belly full. One other thing that we have in the Zen Den is a little snack and a little thing of water. Because if they aren't regulated, um, even satiated or or whatever it may be, it's going to be harder for them to get their heart rate down. Um, Other things that are regulating, if you think about what works for babies, I don't mean that in in a demeaning or condescending way. But I think that's an easy way that I found uh, to kind of simplify it. Anything that kind of works for a baby to soothe a baby is going to help any of us. Um, exercise in some level, right? Like moving arms and legs. Yes, padding. How many kindergarten and first grade and even second grade teachers do you see with rocking chairs? The rocking movement of a rocking chair is soothing. It's regulating, right? It's rhythmic. It's repetitive. Guess what else is repetitive and rhythmic? And you, you see a lot of your kids like in middle school, high school, just disappearing into it right? Music. Now, sometimes you have to be careful and we don't play music that has lyrics in our Zinden um, or anything really that's familiar because just because I think the because you're happy or whatever it is, is is fun. I don't know what their association to that song is, right? And so we play something that's removed that, but just uses rhythm. Or a lot of kids will let them say, hey, you want to look at the white noise stuff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Will you play the cat purring? But again, a cat purring. It's a rhythmic, repetitive thing. Exercise, running, right? Rhythmic and repetitive. Stomp, 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 stomp. You're moving your arms over and over. Um, So when you look even at the bubble tube, rhythmic and repetitive, the bubbles, right? They just keep coming. Play-Doh, you're squishing it, you're squishing it, you're squishing it. Coloring, you're back and forth. 
you're back and forth, right? So when we slow down and we start to think about how many things um, are just kind of simple everyday things, it can be really important to understand, you know, when a kid is scribbling in the classroom, it may be them trying to self-regulate, right? They aren't using that term, the teacher's not using that term, and it might even be getting on their nerves. But if that's the thing that's coming before their explosion, it may be their desperate attempt to be trying to regulate themselves, right? So when it comes to purchasing things, I would just encourage you guys to think about, again, stuff that works for babies, it's stuff that's very simple for all of us that involves some movement and repetitive, predictable, repeated activity. Those are great ideas. We're getting a lot of comments about um, about how they're simple and and make sense. In my office, I have a Bosu ball, which is a half an exercise ball, mm -hmm. and um, the kids like to sit on it with their feet on the floor and just kind of bounce. Yeah, or, or stand up and repetitive, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we can we can do relate next if you guys are feeling a second giveaway absolutely let's go for it <laughs> so first we have regulate you got to get the kid regulated you got to bring the heart rate down i never ever ever when we have a kid who's um eloped and and kind of you know crazed and wild looking around everywhere who i finally get into the zen den be like so tell me what happened no <laughs> it's too soon once they're regulated, then you use the relate piece. And so if you guys can now put in a couple of examples of relating to kids that we use in schools, we'll do our second giveaway. I'll have to reach for this one. It's a big, it's a big giveaway, big size giveaway. So what are some things that we do or can do in schools for the relate piece? I think people are, are quiet and shy. Yeah. Oh, that's okay. Coming in. Oh, okay. So the second piece that we do is the um, the relating piece. And what you'll sometimes see too is kids who, um, kids who don't have a strong foundation of relationships or who have the experience that maybe relationships aren't safe or maybe relationships with women aren't safe or maybe relationships with a white person isn't safe, whatever it may be, you wanna keep in mind that for your processing as well. So. Um, you know, I always make sure that I use my um, my crisis training as well when I am interacting with a kid. So even as I'm processing with them, just because their heart rate is down, does it mean that I can then sit straight across from them and stare at them straight in their face, in their eyes, right? I'll often sit next to them and color with them. And I find that a lot of times kids, uh, while they're doing that and still regulating themselves, uh, they may look to me occasionally, or they may even start directing me, no, you should color that black. Okay, I'm gonna color it black, right? Um, and so that is not the time to um, put any strain on a relationship uh, and say, no, I'm gonna color the shoes brown. <laughs> not that you guys would do that anyways, but um, making sure that you're getting that relationship piece in play, even if it's your first time interacting with a kid, is critical. There is no one in the world that um, really wants to work for somebody that they don't like, right? Um, it's, it's a lot easier for that kid to be disruptive uh, on the school bus, coming back to that example, if the bus driver was never nice to them or never said good morning, right? But if they say good morning, oh, that's the downfall of it all, right? Because now I can't let so-and-so down or I can't do this. Or like, even though I exploded in my classroom, my teacher's done a lot of things throughout the year that I really like. And so I kind of feel bad about what happened in the classroom. Um, and so relationships, relationships, relationships count for everything, everything. 
Um, even when we return a kid back to the classroom, before they leave the Zenden, they check in with us. And this is part of where the reason comes in. And we say, what does Miss Smith need so that her, she and her class can feel safe when you return? What do you need so that you can feel safe when you return? Because biting doesn't work. Okay, it doesn't make your classmates feel safe um, it, at a high school level um, because screaming at your teacher doesn't work. It doesn't work. It might it might work for you, and that's okay. And I and I really do not invalidate that. I hear you. Screaming will work for you. Okay, um, it doesn't work for everybody, and so we have to find something that that works for everyone. Um, and once they're regulated and they have a relationship piece in place, uh, it's it's much easier to get through the the reasoning piece. I love that. It reminds me of um, Dr. M um, McCluskey. I uh, went to a workshop of that he presented at NIASP, and um, he uses sort of a motivational interviewing way of. Uh, talking to kids and, and but he's he's just so warm and when he was modeling how he does this reasoning piece He sits them down and he goes look you and I both know that you're right about XYZ But you know the screaming it's just not it's just not working for you, you know <laughs> so, so what are we gonna do instead? I'm gonna help you what if, let's plan together and it's collaborative and it's warm and It's like just a, a great piece of the puzzle. So so I think we have one more giveaway, right, for a reason. And so I'm going to ask everyone now to think about their favorite strategies for reasoning um, with a child, for helping them define a goal or um, potentially change a behavior, which is the hardest thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or, or or any instance when reason or higher order thinking is needed in the school setting. I always come back to the regulate, relate, reason with teachers as well, um, because sometimes they get very frustrated if a kid isn't able to return back to their work very quickly, or a huge one is after recess, right? The kids are kind of like, whoa, they're jazzed up. And so when they ask them to sit down and do an activity, it, it takes them longer. Um, and, and, and so the... The reasoning is the piece that I think most teachers uh, are interested in <laughs> uh, when it comes to, to learning. But without the first two uh, set and in that order, it's going to be a pill for, for our kids who've had a lot of adversity. Rebecca, it's funny you say that too about Dr. McCloskey, because he was one of my professors in Philadelphia. And so now I'm wondering, maybe he rubbed off on me a little bit. Yes. <laughs> oh, wow. so, yeah. <laughs> um, so I wanted to say, I think we didn't announce it. We did share it on the on the video that Serena won the last giveaway. So Serena, oh, make yes. it us your uh, um, information. I'll pass it on to Dr. Julie. And then um, our first comment was um, from Courtney Miller, who won our last giveaway. She says, validating the child's feelings, thoughts, and then go into reasoning, discuss alternative what's happening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's a super short and easy way to think about relating, right? So we've got our reason, which is kind of like lower brain, our baby regulating stuff. And then our relating is a lot of our counseling skills. Just put on your counseling hat, the one that we're so desperate to use, <laughs> some of us. Uh, and then the reasoning, did we have somebody comment for that? Sorry, I think I missed it. I yeah. think Courtney, she was our first comment after the reasoning. Um, yeah, so discussing alternatives, what happened. It's, it's you know, without um, without the first two things in place, you sound a lot like Charlie Brown's teacher, right? Um, and Andre, yes, um, a think sheet, restoration, and then other things that actually involve a lot of reason are basically our subjects in class math, <laughs> reading comprehension, um, you know, working in a group task, right? You have to use some reasoning skills uh, throughout, throughout your day when you're in school. 
So I have two other two other prizes. You guys just message me. One is the my big amygdala poster. Oh, he's so freaked out. Oh my god. And so I put this up in my office too. And we talk about amygdalas and they're named after almonds and why we have them and why we have stress. Because most of the time kids are like, why do we have that? <laughs> so I find that this poster is a great way to sort of navigate that conversation. And then I also have um, for the last giveaway, little whisk earrings. I'll get those really quickly. So cute. I don't know if you can see them. Little tiny whisk earrings. <laughs> so thank you guys for participating. All right, so um, I don't think we thought this through as far as how do we choose our last two people. I don't know, Rebecca, if you want to do the magic pointing again for comments. Um, so first one for the poster, right? <laughs> And you're muted, so we can't hear you. <laughs> I need to scroll up. So we had three winners. Do we need two more? Is that right? Just three. three. Oh, Just you have three. three. Right? Oh, so we have our three. We okay. have. Yes, we gotcha. have. Three. Sorry, I was confused. <laughs> I will get you there. Um, I, they. I will connect you by email, and then they can share their mailing address with you. And, Perfect. And get their prize. That's so exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Um, All right, so I'm looking for last kind of comments um, or thoughts, but um, you know, this was awesome and, and super, super helpful. And I think that a lot of um, useful strategies and things to bring us into into the new year and, um, you know, those of us returning after break and maybe eventually <laughs> returning into classrooms and things for those of us that are presently virtual. So um, good yeah. stuff. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Not seeing anything else. Eric, do you have a thought? I uh, just wanted to say yes. I really appreciate this. And I think there's so much here. Um, I hope that people will go back through. If you're listening live, go back through and, um, you know, and write some of these things down, write down some of the ideas that were going around in the discussion. A lot of good things were shared. And, um, and as Julie said, you know, th there's no manual for some of this, right? We use our good counseling strategies. We use um, you know, the, the positive ways we talk to children, we um, focus on how positively we relate to staff. Uh, I, I think there's a lot to unpack here that we can use to make a difference in um, supporting staff and students who, who have, you know, who've been impacted by trauma, and we certainly all have, right? So this is valuable to all of us. Awesome. So thanks again. Oh, I'm had a thought that I should tell everybody our next podcast if I could yes. pull up if I had you know thought ahead of time then I would have that ready but I, I have it if okay it's... good <laughs> that's why we keep you around Eric <laughs> <laughs> it's Sonia Luther um, oh, yes. who's a, a great consultant she's worked with Rebecca's school district so um, yes. she's she's fabulous she is a resilience researcher so it'd be a great uh, follow up to this episode um, uh, Dr. Luther has um, spent most of her career studying uh, the factors of, of, for resilience in children and adolescents. And what she's been currently doing is creating surveys for adults and students um, that measure uh, levels of stress and distress and um, and and all kinds of things. So um, it's a great. It's a, her uh, organization is called Authentic Connections. And I highly recommend you check check out her website. And we, um, I look forward to our conversation because it's so interesting, and she's been um, just amazing, amazingly helpful. I'll share a little bit about um, how we've utilized her survey tools in our school um, during the pandemic and and current and last spring and now as well. I'm sure too, Rebecca. You'll see and you guys will be able to talk about the things that are on that checklist and those are the things that are buffers against everything i talked about today right so all the stress the trauma whatever it might be the hardships we all we do all experience them but one thing that helps us get through on the other side is exactly what she's going to be talking about is those resiliency pieces it's having a net underneath you to support you and um 
I, I know that we're at the end of our time today. So I just want to say thank you guys so much for, for having me on. And if anybody needs to email me any questions or you're super curious, I see that we maybe there's some interest for like a checklist of item, items that are in the Zenden. Mm -hmm. You can email me at, at Dr. Julie's Little Things at gmail.com. And I'm also on in, uh, Instagram with the same handle at Dr. Julie's Little Things. That's awesome. So, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Julie. Of course. Thank you, guys. Stay thank safe. You, Good luck tomorrow. Thank yes. You. Drink lots of coffee. <laughs>